G'day, g'day, and welcome to Pints with Aquinas. My name is Matt Frad, and I uh, hope you're doing well. Today we have Father Dominic Legg on the show to discuss Molinism versus Thomism. We'll be explaining what those things mean, and I'm almost certain, if I was a betting man, I would say that Father Dominic is going to put money on the Thomistic perspective. I'd be really shocked if he was like, yeah, Molina, but we will see. Father Dominic, great to have you. Hey, it's great to be with you, Matt. Uh, how's things? I say, I'm not. I'm not totally alone here because knowing the importance of this interview, I, I have something special on my desk here for your viewers to appreciate. This is my my relic of Saint Thomas Aquinas. Can so you I've pass got, me that? I've got a little. Uh, the, yeah. uh, a little intercession, a little a saintly intercession for me there. So well, Father, I, I will. See, I will see your fragment of of femur, and I will raise you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I also have a first-class relic of St. Thomas Aquinas. Did you know this? Okay. No, I didn't know that, but... Uh, no. That's, so that's, okay. So quit well, bragging. We're both, in, we're both in good hands. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah, a Russian Orthodox priest uh, gave it to a friend of mine. I guess he wasn't a huge fan of Thomas, so <laughs> I somehow I somehow landed with it. Glory to God. That's amazing. But, yeah, it's so great to have you on the show. It's been a while since we've chatted, and I always love having you on the show. You're such a clear thinker. Um, and a great expositor of Aquinas and, and what he thinks. So, um, well, I can say the same about you, Matt. I mean, in spades. No, well, thanks. We have, it's funny, we, already we just started this live stream. We have over 100 people watching. And it's got to do with Molinism and Thomism. I don't know how that happened, but uh, people hey, are appara a, it's apparently interested. It's a surprisingly hot topic. Oh, yeah, indeed it is for those who are into it. Hey, are you still working heavily with the Thomistic Institute? I'm the director of the Thomistic Institute. So that would be a yes. <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm working heavily, you could say that. Um, and actually, I want to put in a little plug for our new Aquinas 101 Science and Faith series. So I hope that everyone will go to Aquinas101.com. There's your advertisement. Uh, it's a brand new series. We just launched video number one. Video number two is going out today. So nice. uh, you can see some Thomists engaging with contemporary scientists, and it's really exciting. Oh man, that's fantastic! I'm so glad for all that y'all do, and those little videos you put you put out. Um, is that under Thomistic Institute? Where your it little is. videos that you do? Yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah, yes. I'll put a. So it's, we have we have a you website go. where you can sign up for the course, but then you can also, of course, find them on YouTube. They're hosted on YouTube, so we have a man. YouTube channel for um, uh, the Thomistic Institute, and then it's Aquinas101.com. Yeah, well, y'all are doing excellent work, and it's it's really impressive to see. It kind of came out of nowhere for a lot of people. They're like, wait, who are these Dominicans, and how are they so able to articulate the faith like this? Well, I tell you what, it was uh, Father Gregory Pine, who is the architect of this, uh, or the main the main builder, right? you might say. He and I, he and I uh, were sitting in this very office. I was sitting in this very chair uh, back in 2019 and mm -hmm. talking about, you know, maybe we should do some kind of video thing. We've never. Yeah, it's like, we, why we should have, Matt you know, Frad have the corner market? Well, no, you have, we, were, we wanted to do something that was a little more, uh, we wanted to be like just systematic walking you through the Summa. And we heard from a lot of people saying, you know, we love, we love the resources that you're putting out, but it's sometimes too deep. And we want something that's a little more like systematic, straightforward walk through the Summa. And so, we, so cool. we initially thought, well, let's just put a camera, let's just put up a camera and have a Dominican talking. And then we thought, well, maybe we should do it uh, a little more polished and have animations and stuff. So we went the animation road, and um, that just took us down a, a rather different path from like the kind of live interview style uh, that you it's, have. It's it's really slick. Like it's impressive. Congratulations on investing money in into these videos or whoever is donating. May God bless them and shower His grace upon them because it is so important that we have, you know content uh which <laughs> excellent graphic graphic and graphics and things like this that match the co content you're putting out it is excellent yeah, yeah well we we um it's a lot of a lot of crowdsourcing actually hmm. and so it's a lot of probably some of your viewers right now have already supported the aquinas 101 project so um i mean it takes as you know video production is expensive and it, it just indeed, takes yeah. a, it takes a lot of effort, and we, this is like to be perfectly honest with you. If we had known how much work this was going to be, we would not have done it. <laughs> <laughs> that was generous of the Lord not to inform yeah. you prior. <laughs> All right, excellent. All right, here's what I want to do. I want to um, I want to spend some time having you steel man and explain, and then steel man the Molinist position for us. Let's let's take a good chunk of time to do that, so that everyone watching has a very clear understanding as to what Molinism is, where it came from, 
um, whether you consider it orthodox or at least a, a, maybe not orthodox, that might be the right wrong way of putting it, but like a, a, a valid option for a Catholic who's considering things. Um, and then let's get your response to it. And then uh, for those who are watching in the live chat, we'll do we'll do some Q and A before wrapping up. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so I mean, we're if we're talking about uh, Molina, we're talking about um, a controversy that arose after Protestant the Protestant Reformation, or you might you might think of it as a kind of ongoing rolling controversy in the Protestant Reformation. So, um, you know, the Protestant Reformation is starting in the 1500s, you know, 1520s is when it really gets rolling. Uh, the Council of Trent convened in 1545, mm -hmm. right? So that was actually way into the controversy. And you already had like major problems, fracturing of Christendom. Uh, and uh, so, you know, the, the church was trying to articulate a formal response. The Jesuits were founded in 1540. So just five years before the Council of Trent and after you, we were already into the Protestant uh, Reformation or, you know, after that was already going on. Okay, so what's the origin of the controversy, the famous controversy between the Dominicans and the Jesuits over this issue of predestination and grace? That's, that's really, and freedom, human freedom is a key question in it. So it started actually in 1582. Okay, so this is 42 years after the foundation of the Jesuits. It's after the Council of Trent. Um, and it's, uh, but, but just shortly after, because that's what Trent went on for a very long time. So you have to put yourself kind of in that, in that mindset. And uh, there's some very important things that had happened between the time of Thomas Aquinas and the time of, uh, say, 1582. Aquinas had a kind of synthesis coming out of the classical tradition. You had uh, St. Augustine, you had the Church Fathers, you had Aristotle, uh, and a kind of Neoplatonic uh, philosophy all, all kind of synthesized together in Aquinas. But especially on the issue of grace and human freedom, the key issues there really uh, were importantly developed by St. Augustine. And Aquinas is the inheritor of that tradition. Of course, there are some other very important figures like um, uh, uh, St. Prosper of Aquitaine, who is a follower of, of Augustine and who kind of moderated a little bit the Augustinian view. Aquinas inherits all of that. Okay, so Augustine was dealing with the Pelagian controversy and the semi-Pelagian controversy. There, mm -hmm. the issue is really, can you, by your own will, uh, get to heaven? Can you save yourself? And the church's condemnation of, of Pelagius said, no, absolutely grace is required for salvation, and grace is always first in the order of salvation. It's not that your, your will starts acting rightly, and then God's grace comes to help you along. It's that God's grace comes before you and is the reason why you are making these acts of salvation. Okay, so that's just a very summary position of the background uh, for Aquinas, and Aquinas develops his synthesis of grace and human freedom uh, with that in mind. Okay, but by the time you get to the 16th century, so now we're, we're talking like 1582, um, there have been some very important shifts, philosophical shifts, hmm. and now often the issue of uh, human freedom is posed not in classic Augustinian terms, where freedom is the power of our will to mm -hmm. reach towards the good, mm -hmm. working for happiness. So think of uh, the will as a faculty of loving mm -hmm. or of desiring, okay? Uh, the shift is to start thinking of the will primarily as a faculty of choosing, mm -hmm. meaning to choose between contraries. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a very significant shift because for Augustine and for Aquinas, uh, it was a kind of a given that your will reaches out for what is good. It's like a hungry man reaching out for food. Like you don't, you don't really deliberate about that. You just desire the food. And hmm. so the will, of course, now the will is a rational appetite. So sometimes it has to think about what is really good in this circumstance. But the point is that, or the intellect has to think about it and the yes. will then will desire it. So the point is that the will is always going to be ordered to the good in the Augustinian Thomistic model. Right. And I and, think and that this that's is, just true. Yeah, and this is why we say things like whenever a man sins, he's choosing what appears at least to him to be a good for him. He doesn't choose, even suicide, Aquinas says, is not a man kind of hating himself, but choosing a choosing what he perceives to yeah, be a I good. Yeah, I mean, somebody in great distress is somehow thinks that it would be good to not exist or better to die than to go on or something like that. That's so yeah. that's typically what how we would think about that. Okay, that's the that's the classical Thomistic position on the will. 
But by the time you get to the 16th century, there's been a shift in, in the way it's typically thought about. And that's the context in which the Jesuit theologians are, are trying to respond to the Protestant, uh, you know, you might say the Protestant um, a problem. And um, uh, they are concerned to safeguard human freedom, which they understand to be a faculty of choosing. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a very modern way of thinking about it, and this is why um, a kind of uh, classically Molinist uh, mm -hmm. uh, view is kind of mm, harmonizes with modern ways of thinking about our own place in the world, because we're used to thinking about our will as a faculty of choosing. That is like, I go into the restaurant and I look at the menu yeah, and I've got, uh, I've got fish or I've got beef, right? And I just, I just opt. Hey, you, you you can school me on this a little bit because I think that's what that's what I've thought. Um, I think that if, if you said what is freedom, I would say it's like the ability to to choose or refrain from choosing. I think that's what I would have said. Yeah, well, now, so it's I think it's important to say that it's not Aquinas would not say that that's that that's irrelevant to freedom or that's not a part of freedom, but he would say that's not the core of what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, free choice or free will. That the will is the faculty of choosing the good or desiring the good and so it's always built to do that uh, and it will not deliberate about the end you know so the ultimate good your will just responds to and that's why Aquinas thinks that you're free you're freely loving God immovably eternally in heaven right mm -hmm. so in heaven there's no chance that you're going to commit a sin but it's right. not because God has taken away your freedom it's because your freedom is so perfected by that point that you are absolutely 100% all the time choosing the good. And So could uh, you say something like your freedom is perfected to, to the degree in which you choose the good? Yeah, that's right. That is Aquinas' position. And so freedom really is a... Um, uh, freedom reaches its perfection as it is more and more able and more and more kind of firm in its choice of of what is really good for you hmm. now there's here's here's how we can kind of validate this in our own experience and i must say you know this is a little difficult because it's a uh it's contrary to our, the typical way we think uh mm -hmm. and you know so we just have to be aware of that and and try and go a little deeper to understand this older understanding so switched it just but to um here's a uh a kind of an example that you could use you know, when you commit a sin, we, we've all probably had the experience of um, being trapped in some pattern of sin that we, that we wish we didn't. Uh, now, it might be, you know, you could think about vices with respect to chastity, but you also could think just about um, small acts of selfishness uh, where, like, you just, um, you know, you find it very hard to, I don't know, give, give money to somebody who's asking for asking for help on the street or you find it very hard to uh, be generous to your roommate or to your you know to your brother or your your parents um, you find it very hard to uh, maybe resist having that second piece of cake and you know that you probably shouldn't but you but you do often fall into that you know like eating maybe just a little too much so we all have that experience mm -hmm. and uh, when you um, begin to live the life of grace and you uh, become in a certain way, you, you begin to escape some of those sinful patterns, you do begin to recognize that you are becoming more free. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, so, like, the ability to choose to take heroin uh, is not, that's not a good choice. You're not, <laughs> not going to lead you to freedom, right? Mm -hmm. you, you may be able to do it one time yeah. as a kind of free act, but then increasingly, the further down that path you go, the more, the more trapped you become by it. And you actually experience it as a kind of unfreedom. So mm -hmm. actually, one, one of the things that's interesting about uh, the experience of like real spiritual growth or conversion is that you, you can feel like, whereas before you knew what was good, but you had a very hard time choosing it, and you, that's painful when you have that experience, and you, you feel less free. When God's grace comes and frees you of that sinful pattern and starts empowering you to be more solidly uh, set on choosing what you know is good for you, you experience that actually as a liberation. And what happens? A kind of new zone opens up above you, and you can begin to move in a new direction uh, that maybe before you would have thought was like not even, you didn't even think it, 
You didn't even think about it because you didn't think it was possible. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what Aquinas' account of freedom is trying to get at. That like, if you think that freedom is just opting between a variety of choices, which in themselves are kind of indistinguishably equal, or maybe we would say, well, this one's morally good, but this one's morally bad, but you know, you're equally, it's basically an equal choice between these two contraries. Um, then you're really just describing one instant, one little slice of life. And yes, your, your freedom in a certain way, we can understand what we're talking about when we talk about the choice. But really what freedom is about is the kind of trajectory of your life moving towards the good. And you want to like consistently make your decisions so that you are more and more realizing your potential. And as you do that, your whole scope of your life expands and grows. And so your, your decisions, your individual decisions, like linked all together now start to make sense and are leading you towards a kind of more firm perfection. So you're freer not only when the good is easier to choose, uh, but you're freer when the evil becomes more and more unthinkable or yeah, like not even true. attractive. I mean, yeah. I, I guess unthinkable, it, it will always remain a temptation for us as long as we're in this world. Like it's possible for us to sin and we, you know, we experience that, we know that. But I'm, I'm thinking of somebody, your example of the heroin addict, right? And suppose yeah, he's been right. hooked on heroin for a couple of years and he wakes up one day and he watches a Jordan Peterson video and he decides to get his house in order and he, he begins to wean himself off of heroin. And at first it's very difficult, but he has this I ideal, he wants to be a better person and he, he gradually ceases to use it. And he comes to the point where he doesn't desire it and even the idea of taking it, while it may be tempting at times, is is overall abhorrent. So you yeah, would say that that, right. that man is is a free man, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. My problem is I don't think any Molinist would disagree with that. So I really want to understand what Molinism yeah. is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, let's go. Let's go back to Molinism and try and try and understand that. Steel man. Um, Steel man. Okay. You've heard that phrase, haven't you? Or Steel man. No, I haven't. Okay, well, but, I should explain uh, is that, that refer to like Man of Steel, like Superman. Okay, it's <laughs> no, <laughs> it's the it's the co it's the opposite of straw manning. Ah, Steel Man. Okay, I understand. I, I should have All explained right, so this. I best... asked you a question like five minutes ago, and I didn't even explain it. Right. So Aquinas Steel Man's his opponent's positions. He makes them stronger. Yes. Got it. Got it. I mean, his argument from from evil against God's existence. You read that, you're like, oh wow. Like I don't know how to get out of this, you know. And so that's what I that's what I wanted. I want you to help us do. Um, okay. So okay, just I, at a very, I, at me, a very basic. Start. Okay, I mean, I, I want to, I want to do a little historical explanation of like okay. the genesis of the controversy because I think it's, I think it does. That is super things. important. Yes, I agree. Um, okay, so there was a, you know, back in in the scholastic university, uh, like in the 16th century, but even in the time of Aquinas, they had these disputations. It's like a formal academic debate. So there was a disputation. This is an interesting story, um, and there was a Jesuit. His name was Prudentius Montemayor. And he stood up and he was supposed to, he was on the hot seat, right? So he's mm -hmm. giving the arguments. And he was defending the position that, uh, that Christ did not die freely if the Father gave him a command to do so. Hmm. Okay, so it, what, what's his position? It's, he, he wants to say, well, obviously Christ died freely. So we must say that the Father did not command him to do so. Because if the father commanded him to do so, he wouldn't have been free to obey that because Jesus always does what the father commands. So basically, we have to say then, the father didn't give a command there, and Jesus just freely chose to do it. Okay, so you see the, this debate over human freedom, it's already there, right? That's very because helpful. the presupposition of the argument that the Jesuit is making there is that these are incompatible, that the father tells you, tells Jesus, like as man, what is good. And if he tells him that, then the will would not be free because it would be no longer uh, able to choose between contraries. It would be supposed to choose what's good. Yes. Now for Aquinas, Aquinas would say, well, there's no problem there. The father can give you a command and you freely do it. Um, and that's, that's just, that's the way it works. So uh, even if your human will were moved by the father to do it, it could be a free act. That would be a coin. Okay, so that's that's the background for the position. And there was a Dominican at this disputation. His name was Domingo Banez, a famous uh, 16th century Dominican. Okay, Banez um, uh, basically objected. And then there was an Augustinian who objected. And then there was a uh, Carmelite who objected. And you get this enormous like uproar at this debate. 
Okay. And as a result, all these different parties started trying to get the other party like uh, in trouble with the ecclesiastical authorities for positions that they thought were were theologically suspect. And that that led to this big debate that lasted generations, really, between Dominicans and Jesuits. And so in order to kind of clarify the debate, you had this guy, Luis de Molina, who is a Jesuit, who wrote a kind of a treatise to explain the Jesuit position. And that's where this debate starts. Okay, so what's what's the uh, what's the Molinist position? Um, I've got some notes here. I'm just gonna uh, bring them up here so that I can give you my my nice um, uh, summary uh, summary. You're not, allowed, you're not allowed to read it in a, with a sarcastic tone either. I'm, I'm oh, not gonna boo -boo 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 -boo. Yeah. Not, okay, so it. so really the the um, the controversy became kind of centered on the issue of predestination uh, and uh, human freedom, right? So that the real concern on the Jesuit side or the Molinist concern is how can we say that God predestines us infallibly to salvation and that we are free? Yes. Okay. So that is the issue. And so he's got to, he's got to then, I mean, he sort of, takes as a presupposition, well, we're obviously free. Yes. Uh, all right, then how, how do we come up with a theory of predestination? That's the issue. Now, note that for Aquinas, Aquinas would say, this is not, there's not a conflict between these two things. Because if you understand what, uh, you know, predestination is God, for Aquinas, predestination is God's eternal plan of our salvation, and he will move us efficaciously but freely to choose to do the good for those he predestines. Okay, so Aquinas has a totally different solution. Well, let's just stick with the Molinist view. It starts with this presupposition about freedom and grace, which Aquinas would probably disagree with. But so Molina's, Molina's work makes this argument. Uh, we have to come up with a theory of predestination that respects human freedom, human free will. And why is that so important in the 16th century? Because you have Protestants who are basically saying, you know what? God's grace just forces your will and you're not, you don't make a free action. There's no freedom. So the Catholics are, are like, uh Oh, Protestants are saying we're not free, like great, heavy, heavy dose of grace, no freedom. And so what we want to do is we want to emphasize, no, 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 uh, freedom, you know, grace, grace, yes, but freedom also. And so that's the, the Jesuit movement, which is trying to respond Excellent. to Protestantism is wanted to accentuate the Catholic teaching on free will. Okay, right. and, and so that, reason, that's what Molina reason, is after. Part of the reason Molinism has sort of come in vogue again in Protestant circles is it seems like an intellectually respectable response to Calvinism. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so, uh, so Molina has this strong view of freedom, and now he's got to come up with a way of explaining predestination to save it, you know, to like put these two together. Uh, because predestination is a scriptural truth. And that's something that, you know, maybe it's worth recalling also for, uh, you know, everyone who's who's listening in that in, um, you know, you, you find it in a number of places in the Gospels in St. Paul, um, for example, uh, in um, John chapter 10, Jesus says, you know, my sheep hear my voice. Uh, I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Right. So if you're in the hand of Jesus, you're, you're going to be safe. Um, or uh, the, uh, you know, text from, from St. Paul, this is Ephesians 1, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. He predestined us in love to be his sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose, purpose of his will. Or uh, Romans 8, um, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Okay. So predestination is a scriptural truth, right? So Molina, that's what Molina is uh, working with. So back to, back to Molina, right? Molina argues that uh, he basically solves the problem of predestination and human freedom by uh, articulating human, uh, by articulating predestination in terms of the created order God uh, chooses to create. Okay. So, um, God decides to bestow grace uh, on people foreseeing mm -hmm. that in this created order, 
that grace will be effective. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the person will respond to the grace, will work with the grace, will say yes to the grace, and will be saved. So how does God predestine? He predestines by foreseeing Mm -hmm. in this particular created world, like, you know, you can line up all the possible created worlds. It's like, over here, Matt Frad remains an inveterate sinner, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, But if I put him, if I, if I tweak the circumstances of his life and put him in this world, then I see actually when I give him this grace, his will is going to freely respond. And so God decides, okay, I'm going to create this world where Matt Frad is going to respond positively to the grace that I offer him. Uh, so that, that response remains completely free. In other words, the, the genius of this solution is that uh, Molina has found a way to say, we can be certain that Matt Frad is saved, but God does not enter into the choice of his will. Mm-hmm. God just has decided the the world in which Matt Frad is going to exist. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? It makes complete sense. Yeah, and I think for most of us, like that's that makes a lot of sense. So it's, the idea is that you know, kind of before the creation of the world, God foresaw how Matt Frad would act under certain circumstances, and chose whether or not he would be predestined or not by putting him in those particular circumstances or not. That's right. And so too with everybody else. So predestination, in other words, in Molina's system, is not found essentially in God's uh, hmm. God's determination of the graces he's going to give, but rather in God's choice of what created world he's going to create. So it's like already yeah. built into built into yes. creation, into and that's. Fabric. That's in order to say that your free act is undirected by God. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, awesome. Um, so it's totally undetermined, and that's that's Molina's definition of freedom. That was so fantastic. I really appreciate it. Here's what I really need help with. I really need help with understanding um aquinas again i know you spent some time explaining that but it's still the idea that god is moving the will to choose him and that this is in some somehow doesn't impinge upon our free will still seems like a foreign concept to us i think yeah well so then uh here's here's some of the i mean to get into the details of the problems with uh that like a thomist would see with the molinist system i think in order to in order to understand the beginning point it's to go back to that issue of human freedom. Mm-hmm. Uh, is this an adequate definition of freedom to think that freedom is basically these choices between contraries, like to choose good or to choose evil? And that this has to be, in order to be free, it has to be a completely uh, undetermined act. Um, so Aquinas wouldn't accept that. And he would say, in fact, the, that that is a problematic view of freedom because then uh, for example, the, uh, you know, the, the saints in heaven, um, yeah. we have a hard time understanding how they're free. No, uh, have, the, yeah. Well, here's two options for you. Or, One uh, would let, be the, I mean, let's just give me a second here because also like the blessed Virgin Mary, right? Okay. What about Christ's human will? That's where this controversy started. Remember? Uh, yeah. Uh, so is, is if, if Christ could not sin, right. Uh, does that mean he wasn't free? Well, I, we have to say that he's free. Interesting. Um, okay, so then we, we could also get into the angels, the freedom of the angels. What about the freedom of God? Can we say that God is free? Uh, and so all of these things are, are involved when you make that shift in how you understand freedom. And I think the Thomist would say, you know what? The only way in the end you're going to be able to say all of those, all of those uh, persons are free, divine persons, human persons, etc., is is to uh, angelic persons um, is to say uh, that we have a deeper understanding of freedom, so that free that that account of freedom is not going to be sufficient. Yeah. That, okay. That that's, makes sense. That would be point number one. Point number two. I, I don't want to. I'm, I'm. Let me just get this point out here, no, and then you're I'll. You're fine. You're fine, Father. Go. Uh, point number two would be, um, how do we account for there being something in creation, the human will, 
uh, in the Molinist understanding that is a self mover that goes from potency to act with no preceding principle of act. So this is like Aquinas's proofs for God's existence. Uh, one of the key proofs is about potency and act. And he basically says, you know, you, if you have something that goes from potency to act, like a capability to be doing something to actually doing it, you have to be able to account for how it, how it goes from being like not acting to acting. And that can only be explained by something that's already acting. So like, uh, you know, in, in a, um, well, yeah, uh, I, I could explain that more, but maybe that's already clear to, uh, yeah, it's clear. clear to your listeners who are up on well, the idea, mystic easy, medicine. Easy example bit. would be fire, right? A stick. Yeah. Right. So you, you have to have something that's hot in order yeah. to take something that's cold and make it, make it hot. Um, of course we can use contemporary science to maybe add some qualifications to that, but okay. You know, uh, in any case, the principle there is you need something in act to take something that's in potency and put it into act. Yes. Nothing goes from potency into act of itself. There needs to be some preceding act. Okay. So where is the ultimate root of that act? It's got to be God. So there has to be some first being who is pure act with no potency. And everything that goes from potency to act has to in some way depend on, on that. That's a kind of profound metaphysical principle um, that, it, that pervades Aquinas' thought. And Aquinas would say the, the Jesuit position on freedom there, or the Molinist position, violates that principle. Because now you have a, a will which is able to go in the order of willing from potency to act with no preceding activation. So Aquinas is actually very, very clear on this, not only in talking about grace, but just talking about natural actions of the human will, that there always has to be some gift That's of right. act coming from God by which the human will goes from potentially willingness to actually willing it. And he thinks that's just due to our nature, like that every act of the human will has that kind of metaphysical presupposition. It's, and it's to talk about this in terms of first and second causality, if that's also familiar to you, this is, we're not saying that God moves the will right. the way a creature could move the will. We're talking about the metaphysical underpinnings of the human creature, of the human soul, you might say, or the creature's spiritual activity. So metaphysically, there needs to be some principle of actuality standing behind our act, just the same way so that, that our very it, being is being held in being by God. It wouldn't be sufficient to say it was the coffee which activated my potential desire for it or my potential drinking it to acting. That's right. Yeah. And, and again, explain that again. Why, why isn't that sufficient? I've got objects in the world that act upon my desires. And then bring that's right. That but, potential but you you to have action. to already be you have to you have to already be like alive, right? For for that to to work. Yes. Yes, um, and work so there's there's got to be a principle of act there preceding that. But yep. but more than that, when you are um, when you are so you if we just talk about bodily appetites, there has to be something that's actual in the in the animal body that is like moving the animal's powers. To like walk over to the to the dish of food and and eat the food, right? Mm -hmm. You know the dog Fido of has. A dog. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, uh, so, yes. but but with the will, we're talking about something that's not bodily, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a bodily appetite for uh, coffee, as much as what, like when we're talking about the spiritual acts, like you're you're uh, willing something. Okay. Um, I I offer you. Uh, I don't know that I, I offer you a gesture of friendship and, and you, you decide, yeah, you know, I want to be friends. I'm going to reach out in like, I'm going to smile and respond with, uh, I'm going to say yes to that. Uh, I don't know, to that invitation to come over and hang out at the Dominican house of studies. We'd love to have you. Um, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so in order to ex fully explain the potential we have to act in any way, we have to posit God. God has to God but, has to come into that. Yeah, ultimately, Aquinas says that every act 
uh, of the human will has to has to have a kind of metaphysical presupposition that God is moving your will from potency to act. Hmm. And you can find this very. I, I, if you if you want to take a minute, I can I can uh, find the passage in the Prima Pars where Aquinas treats that. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, it's a it's a strong claim, it and is it's a, strong a claim. it's a metaphysical he's claim. About, he's not just talking about kind of chronology. He's not saying like. God is no, it's definitely, mover, and that's how you now exist, and now you don't need God to choose. You're saying, like, right now, I somehow need God in order to make any choice at all. That's right, and it's definitely not chronology, which is why traditionally it's called pre-motion. So uh, the pre-motion of the will. And what, what it's trying to get at is the first causality of God, VCV, the secondary causality of the creature. So this is, it's, it's I mean, this requires some metaphysical thinking you have to kind of push your mind to yeah. think in this way because you have to start thinking about divine causality versus creaturely causality and one of the accusations that the domingo Banyas, the dominican makes against molina is that molina is turning god's causality into a kind of causality like human causality and so he's kind of moving it from a first cause into being a second cause uh, oh. so that you begin saying, oh, well, if God moved me to do that, then it couldn't have been free. Uh, and and Banya says, no, time out. You don't understand. God's causality is of a totally different order than human causality. Hmm. These are hierarchically ordered causes. One is a first cause. One is a second cause. Every act you make is pre-moved by God. And so every act of freedom has to have that kind of divine activation in there. So even the acts of sin, God is is giving you the the activation of your will to move you to it. Now, is God the cause of sin? No. Your will is determining what you're going to do, but the the uh, God respects you enough to even give you the gift of that act when you are going to commit a sin. Yeah, so far to my uh, my struggling intellect in this conversation, the one thing that's really struck me is what you said about Christ. So, right, so we could say like the Blessed Virgin Mary could have sinned, but wouldn't have, right? Jesus Christ could not have sinned, and of course did not sin. But but I don't know anybody who would say Jesus was therefore not free. I wonder what the Molinist would say to that. Well, this was this was one of the the puzzles that that got the whole controversy going, uh, and so they wanted to say, well, um, in his human will, uh, God didn't require him to uh, act that way. You know, it's a good question. I, I I should go see if I can find out what Molina actually says about that. Yeah, um, or even just kind of modern Molinists like William Lang Craig and others. I wonder how they kind of kind of get around that. Yeah. Because this is sort of like apologetics 101 when you kind of get up in front of a group of teenagers or you're speaking to people about God. They want to know if God knows everything, how am I free? If he knows I'll end up in heaven or hell, how am I free? And if he wills some of us to go to heaven, wasn't I just not free not to? Um, and so let, right, me, like let, me, yeah. let me back up a little bit and go back to the kind of the big picture because I think it's helpful Please. to kind of understand what the Thomist uh, claim is trying to make here. So, um, uh, if you think about uh, what is a human nature, so a, a human nature is not just like a raw datum, but is a, an intelligible essence that has goods that are perfective of it in the natural order, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, we're, we're made for certain goods, and when we move in that direction, we are moving towards our happiness and our perfection. Okay, okay so the will is the rational faculty that is made to uh, choose with the power of reason those goods and, and actually to desire them to move us on the path towards our, our perfection. So the intellect grasps something as good and the will responds with its, with its movement uh, to desire it. Okay, Excellent. but here's the problem. We are fallen creatures. So after the fall, the will becomes stuck on lower goods and becomes trapped by them. Think of the heroin addict. You begin mm -hmm. taking heroin. Sin is like heroin for Aquinas. So mm -hmm. sin is addictive and it, it 
diminishes your freedom and it traps you. So the more you do it, the more trapped you become by it. And your, your intellect can recognize that it's bad for you, but you can't get out of it and you keep doing it and you feel more and more wretched as that dynamic continues. Uh, so that's, that's why like sin can be really a, a wretched situation. Okay. So you're stuck in the sinful cycle. Um, by being attracted, kind of trapped by these lower goods, even when you recognize that they're lower goods. And the will cannot detach itself of itself uh, mm. from those things. So what we need is help from above to, <laughs> to break that cycle of addiction, as it were, and to mm. turn the will back not just to goods of, of nature, but even to supernatural goods, goods that are above what the human intellect and the human hmm. will could ever have desired on their own. And that is the divine promise. That's the supernatural order, the supernatural life that God is calling us hmm. to. Okay, okay, so when we're awesome. talking about God's grace, we're talking about that gift by which God breaks the, uh, the addiction to evil, to lower goods. I mean, so it's not, maybe it's a mistake to even there say evil because uh, metaphysically, mm -hmm. you're always attracted to some good. It's just an unfitting good. And he's right. going to break that attraction or that addiction and enable you to return to what you were supposed to be, which is ordered to God. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's not just ordered to God as, an, as a natural good, but ordered to God in the supernatural order, like knowing him and loving him. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why for Aquinas, it's important to say that God, by his grace, can actually enter into your willing mm -hmm. and free it from its being stuck oh. on those lower things. I'm and getting move there. it to higher. This is okay. helping. <laughs> so here's the problem. In the Molinist system, that whole framework of attraction to the good is no longer at play. Because what is the will doing in the Molinist system? The will is an individual, uh, like discrete faculty of choosing between contraries. So the Molinist system is going to analyze human freedom by just looking at this, this particular choice is a choice to take heroin today or not take heroin today. And the bigger picture of uh, the attraction to the good and the, um, the moving of the will to uh, be elevated to supernatural goods is not in the picture there. Uh, so now the will, in order to basically, how then does grace work in the Molinist system? God comes along and he, he encourages you. He says, Matt, you could have this higher good. You could do it. Come on, Matt, you can do it. Right. And uh, Grace he says, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to like, I'm going to put my arm around your shoulder and I'm going to tell you, don't take the heroin today. Um, so God is, is operating more like a friend who's with you, who's accompanying you, yes. who's helping you. Uh, but he's not actually entering into the will and changing it to love God. So Molina's that, example, Mol uh, this is Molina's example, is that uh, Grace is like two uh, people in a boat, each of them has an oar. And now so that you've got an oar and, and God's got an oar. And, and the, the Thomas response to that is, um, it's a mistake to put God and the human will on the same level. Yes. Uh, and actually we, ha we want to understand that God is moving you in a different way than any creature is going to move you by actually, because he's the creator of your nature, he can enter into your will and he can reorder it so that it is freely loving him. And when God moves you that way, you do not experience it as if he is taking away your freedom. You experience it as a liberation from a defect, which in fact was an addiction. And so, so when you're liberated, you say, I'm free for the first time in my life, which a Molinist cannot really account for in a robust way because you, were, had, the, you had the option of choosing before and you have the option of choosing now. Uh, but the Thomas would say, well, no, there's something very different because when the will is reordered to the good, it possesses its freedom in a higher capacity, in a higher right, let me see if I can Let me see if I can break this down for people of my intellect. So according to Aquinas, God uses grace to sober man up so that he may see reality rightly. That's right, and he can do it over time, but he can also do it instantaneously. So and so, that, and we and this we clearly isn't an imposition on our free will to be woken up. That's uh, right. To be to be, uh, I, I really like that. That was that's that was really helpful. Thank you. 
Hey, we, we got a bunch of questions. I know this is such a large topic, uh, Father, and um, you know, at any point you want to just f tie something up, feel free, but would it be okay sure. if we took some questions? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, Jackson Nichols says, thanks for being a patron, Jackson. He says, are there any readings outside the Summa, which is great, that would help... <laughs> This is his way of being like, I'm not saying that's not sufficient. Um, which that would help. Hey, no, it's a great question. Understand the Thomistic view of human freedom. Yeah, the the best, probably easiest entry point here is an awesome book, and I have it. If I Get well, it. if I dare, do it, do it. Okay, right here. Uh, I'm putting my headset back on. Um, this is the book. Uh, surveys, pink cares. Oh. The sources of yes. Christian ethics. This is kind of classic. Uh, it was from a. Um, it was written about uh, oh maybe twenty years ago um, by a Dominican at the University of Fribourg. He wrote it in French and it was translated into English. And he uh, talks about these two understandings of freedom. And he works through a whole bunch of examples. So actually, it's really um, hmm. he kind of breaks it down. Now I must say, when I was uh, a young Dominican, this book was assigned for uh, one of my classes. And I read it, and it was like, oh my gosh, this book changed my life. It, it absolutely, I know many people who've read this book, and they, they say the same thing. It's like, it totally blew my mind. I never thought about um, human freedom that way. And when you, it, it's, it's not easy, because you have to like, you have to like think through all these examples and, and work back over them. But as you do it, uh, it, it's like, it kind of reconfigures. It's a new paradigm for thinking about the world. And awesome. uh, I... So I can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, patron Nick Buckner, thank you, says, In a Molinist framework, why would God create any world in which anyone would not choose salvation? How can Molinism avoid universalism without violating God's benevolence? Ooh. Hey, Nick, this is an awesome question. And actually, it's a, it's a bigger question than just Molinism or Thomism or something like that. It's really a question about um, God's permission of evil. And uh, that is another very hot topic today, uh, but it's not this topic. Uh, why is it? Because Molinists and Thomists are going to have to deal with this question. That it's, one does not necessarily have a, I mean, their solutions are different, but mm -hmm. they both um, will have the same defects from the perspective of a universalist. Um, okay. So. Uh, both of them are going to say, yeah, you know, God, God foresees that some people are going to be lost and he could save them. Like he could make it different, but he chooses not to. Right. And that's true on Thomism and, as well, is what you're saying. Yeah, that's so that's that's mysterious. And I think the, the best answer to that um, is uh, we are very imperfect in our understanding of the world and of, of God's plan. So um, this is, you know, this is St. Paul in the letter to the Romans, where he, uh, you know, he, St. Paul himself addresses this question, and his answer is, oh, the riches of the, of the wisdom and, it, like, the inscrutable wisdom of God. Um, who are we to accuse God of doing it wrong, right? Um, and so, basically, we don't understand God's plan. Here's what we know. We know that God is perfectly good, and we know that God is perfectly loving and perfectly merciful, and that uh, when we finally do see in some measure God's plan, uh, we're going to see that it was it was better than our plan. Um, but from our perspective today, like I look, you know, I look at the world and I say, gosh, wouldn't it be better that there was less that there was less sin in the world? Wouldn't it be better if there were less physical suffering in the world, less pain? Yes, I mean, wouldn't it be better if we had no COVID? Wouldn't it be better if there was no war? Wouldn't it be better if I myself were a better person? Um, and the answer to all of those things is yes. Uh, why doesn't God make me better? I don't know. Um, why doesn't God make, make COVID go away? I don't know. Why does he permit it? We, we trust that he has some providential plan here and that he's going to bring good, uh, an even greater good out of evil than we can grasp. Um, last thing that I'll say on this point, and this is, uh, this is kind of a, you know, one of those kind of deep head scratching kind of points. Aquinas thinks that this common phrase that we that we use like oh well in the best of all possible worlds blah 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 aquinas says there is no best possible of all uh, best of all possible worlds that yeah. is an that is an absurd idea it's like saying the largest of all possible numbers you know 
pick the largest of all possible numbers. It, it's, it's an absurd uh, category. There is no largest of all possible numbers. You can always add, a number, add, add one and make it bigger. And in fact, since God is infinitely good, infinitely good, any finite order could always be better. And so there cannot be a best possible world. So whatever world God creates could have been better. So it is absurd for us to say, oh, he should have done it better. Hmm. Okay. Skylar Higgs says, from a Molinist point of view, how do humans still have free will when God places them into a setting where he knows they can prosper, yet ultimately knows certain individuals will choose otherwise? Yeah. So, I mean, in a certain way, this is related to the previous question. So mm -hmm. if, uh, if God foresees that you're going to behave badly in one created world, why doesn't he just like make a different world and make it, make it put you in circumstances where you, you won't? Um, and that's, that's a legitimate question for the Molinist system. Um, so that, I mean, I think the answer is, well, it, this is just the providential order that God decided to, God decided to create. Um, I'm a seminarian, says Jackson Nichols, so I'm sure I'll study enough about it in due time, but I'm trying to get a head start. Thank you, Father. Okay. I'm trying to find ones that we haven't answered already. So this person says, does Thomas predestination rely on a form of compatibilism? Hmm. Well, here I have to confess my ignorance of exactly what, uh, what is meant by compatibilism. I know in some analytic Thomas circles that that phrase is used but you know i'm not sure i'm ready I, to I, answer think, that. I mean i think what he means by that is god predestines and we we our, our choice ends up being compatible with what he chooses so god makes things happen um you know uh, i think this is more of a kind of a calvinist view but that we can we, it's not that our will again this is coming at it from a probably protestant perspective but it's not as if our will is snuffed out we can we still have free will and it just so happens that our will aligns or is compatible with what he predestines yeah that sounds more like the molinist uh position yeah or you know there were other jesuits who came after molina who tried to to um nuance his system a little bit so uh francisco suarez who is a famous uh jesuit developed something called congruism which sounds a little bit to me like maybe what that compatibilism uh is mm. trying to describe and the congruous position was basically that God foresees what you will do in different circumstances. And so uh, grace is efficacious when it comes to you in a way that's congruous to you. Like it, uh, you know, just like this morning, given your schedule, um, you know, and the fact that the church is really close, God gives you a little uh, invitation to go make a visit to the Blessed Sacrament. And it's efficacious because it was congruous to your circumstances this morning. But tomorrow morning, you're going to have a really busy morning and you'll be stressed out. And when he gives you that little invitation, you're going to say, no, 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 I'm not going to do that because uh, it came at an incongruous time. Mm. Kyle Spectra says, would you state the development of Molinism coincides with the greater prominence of the moderate primacy of the will over the intellect in the Franciscan tradition? Actually, that's an awesome question. Really Could interesting. Could you reformulate that question. for us, Father? Yeah. So, so the basic question that um, in Thomas Aquinas, you get a strong sense that um, in the logical order, in the order, uh, you might say the, um, yeah, there's not an order of time, but there's an order of kind of logical. There's a logical primacy of the intellect over the will. The will doesn't love what it doesn't know, and so the the intellect has to know before the will can love or desire. And uh, so in Aquinas, he will talk first about the, the will of God and then talk about the, the love of God, or the, um, sorry, the, the intellect of God and then uh, the will of God. Does that make sense, what I've just said? Um, yes. When you get into um, some of the, the Franciscan thinkers, so you start, arguably starts with Bonaventure, and then SCOTUS, but definitely when you get to William of Ockham, all three are, are Franciscans, uh, you have a, a, a relative adjustment there where they will put the primacy on the side of God's loving uh, over like the intellect, God's intellect making a plan. Um, so their, their account of the divine 
pro, you know, divine providential plan really is, is first with reference to God's plan of love. They emphasize the love before they emphasize the ordering uh, of the intellect. Um, and the result that that leads to is that you begin to think that um, morality is obeying the will of God because the mm -hmm. providential plan of God, God's plan of salvation, is really a matter of his willing. And if that's the case, then, um, then what is good and what is evil depends on configuring our will to God's will. But it, you're, you're starting, when you start down that road, you begin to lose the sense that, well, there's actually an ontological good there that God has ordered us towards. So for Aquinas would say, yes, okay, it's true that when you, you need to will what God wills, but why does God will that for you? Because he has a plan, a plan of his intellect, a plan of order, a plan that you're, you're made for this good and he wants you to move towards it. And so uh, in a certain sense, it's not just because God willed it that it's good. God wills it because it's good. Uh, he's conceived it in his mind already as good. So Aquinas says a very interesting thing. He says that mm. God's intellect is like a law for his will. You think about that for a minute. God's, intellect, God's intellect is like a law for God's will. Mm. So God's willing follows the plan of God's intellect. God conceives the plan of salvation first in his intellect. It's, a, it's an ordering of all things back to God. And then he wills it. So when we talk about obeying the will of God, Aquinas would actually say, yeah, we're obeying God's will, but we're also obeying God's, we're configuring ourselves to God's plan, which is a plan of order. Uh, and uh, that means that our um, determination of what is good has some reference to like the real order of salvation and not just to some inexplicable will of God. So that when you, when you unravel this, this theory about the primacy of the will uh, in God, you end up with, well, you know, it's just an inexplicable decree of God that if you do X, you'll be saved. And X has, you know, there's no necessary relationship between doing X and being saved. The, the most radical example of this is in William of Ockham, mm. the Franciscan, who says that God could require you to hate him in order to be saved. And Does he really that say that, that explicitly? He, he thinks, is that not a misreading he, he, of him? Well, at, at least as I understand, I mean, I, I'm... I've I'm had some Franciscans from, push from this book, actually. I've had some Franciscans push back on me. That's the only reason I ask. Okay. I don't know. I've always, I've always ha held that as well, but... Uh... Okay, well, uh, if, if there's, I mean, if there's a textual problem with that, with that claim, um, then I'm, I'm happy to be corrected, actually, uh, yeah. because I want to be, I want to get William of Ockham uh, right here. But the certainly Ockham places the primacy on, on God's will. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, here's, a, here's a good question that kind of clarifies freedom in heaven. Uh, Aaron Miller says, how could many angels reject God's love while with him in heaven? Why can't humans not do the same in heaven? That's a, that's a great question, too, because uh, it gets back to the question of angelic choice. So Aquinas thinks that the angels... Uh, now, I haven't studied this in a little while, so I, I hope I don't make some, some obvious flubs. The Thomists on the line will, will correct me if I, if I flub this one. But uh, my, my recollection is that um, how Aquinas treats this, the angels are created and they are offered in the first instant of their, uh, mm -hmm. of their existence the opportunity to make a choice, and that choice they then are going to make for the rest of eternity. So uh, I think it's probably best not to think of them having like one instant when they make a choice and then they're stuck forever um, with that choice. Like even if they wanted to change their mind, it's too late. Like they've already they've already put in their order, as it were, you know. And so the kitchen's going to send out the the beef, even though they wanted the fish. Um, no, they they are perpetually willing whatever they will in the first instant of their existence. And there is a medieval debate about uh, whether they see God in the first instant of their existence and then make their choice or not. And Aquinas, as I uh, recollect, 
uh, holds that they do not see God in the first instant of that existence, um, but that they are offered this, uh, this grace, um, and some reject God, some do not. Uh, and those who, those who, who uh, love God then receive the beatific vision, uh, those who do not are the fallen angels. Okay. So we, so us in heaven are not, we're not in the same position as an angel at the first moment of its existence. That's the short answer. Okay. Yeah, this has been super helpful. So as we wrap up here today, Father, I would love for you just to kind of take one last swipe at this. Um, you know, what? help us understand how Aquinas reconciles God's, you know, providentially ordering the world um, without interfering with our free will. Uh, how should how should we understand this? How does Aquinas help help us out of this conundrum? So, maybe I should go back to the question of, of predestination and talk for uh, like work our way forward from that. So God is the cause of all things, and He creates the whole world with a providential plan for all things to be ordered back to Himself. And that's like in the widest possible scope. We're talking about divine providence that encompasses everything, including you know like asteroids and rocks and trees and dogs and cats and us. Okay, but when we're talking about the specific providence that God has for human beings in the order of salvation, that's what we're talking about when we talk about predestination. So predestination, it's God's providential plan for those whom he saves, by which he brings them to salvation through his grace. Um, so uh, for Aquinas, this really is causal. So God causes our salvation. And we don't want to say that we are the cause of our salvation. We want to say that God is the cause of our salvation. Mm -hmm. um, and he causes that salvation by giving us grace by which we freely know and love him. So that freedom of knowing and loving God is not contrary to the claim that God has uh, predestined us or has a providential plan for our salvation or that God gives us graces that are, um, that are efficacious in moving us from being, from loving lower things to loving higher things. And I think that's, that's the, you know, that's the key for the Thomistic understanding is that the will is a faculty of loving, of desiring, uh, but it gets trapped by lower things after sin. Mm -hmm. And we, we wound ourselves by sin so that we cannot, it's like you're in a hole, you cannot get yourself out of the hole. And you're just going to be down there with whatever you've whatever you've chosen down there, um, and we do experience that kind of that kind of um, uh, enchaining, you know, or um, addiction of the will uh, when we sin. So I think many of us do have some some experience of it, uh, and also the experience of liberation that the grace brings about, and that that uh, that's what Aquinas is trying to describe. So by grace, God is healing us of the mm. damage to ourselves that we do by sin. And he is uh, giving us now the capacity to love him, to, to like ascend to him, which is something that our will of its own power could never have done uh, when it's in the state of sin. Yeah, I'm thinking of another analogy. You tell me if this is any good. The idea of a, of a man on, uh, on, a, on his, on, on a, in a hospital bed and he has absolutely no appetite. So he doesn't desire what is good for him. Uh, but as he is healed, he naturally does desire that which is good for him. Uh, and we wouldn't say that the doctor in healing him took away his choice because he didn't choose to starve or some such. Is that, does it, we're getting yeah, somewhere Yeah, that's, that's, that, that does get somewhere. Um, and, uh, you know, with any analogy, there's going to be some mm -hmm. things that work and some things that don't work. So what works there is that you're, in a way, you're respecting what the, what the, person is made for. Um, what would I want to add to that example would be that in the order of salvation, our will is never going to be able to naturally desire gotcha. or naturally attain to God. And so that really, it, when you're talking about salvation, you really do see how it has to really be supernatural. Like God really has to give you that power because you will never get it from, from your own resources. Okay. Even no, if I you were afflicted by sin. Yeah, I understand that all analogies limp and end up being kind of 
sometimes more disanalogous. But in this in this analogy, the, if the doctor is healing him, it, it, wouldn't that be analogous to God's giving us supernatural life to choose him? Yeah, yeah. There's there is there's an analogy there. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, we do use medical analogies all the time in the in the you know teaching on grace, yeah, wound, yeah. Okay. sin, illness, yeah. defect. Yeah. This has been super helpful, and I really appreciate. it. I mean, it. another another example that Aquinas uses regularly is like somebody who has a wounded leg. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have a wounded leg and you try to run, you just fall down. Yes. Um, and so uh, God needs to heal the leg um, in order for you to to act rightly. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a lot of people asking about you know free will and hell and things like this and and again this might, this might be a totally different topic. Um, you know sometimes I. Mm, okay, so here's the question. I was ask it. How is it just for God to send anyone to hell if He could simply provide quote unquote sobriety to anyone, or does our free will to deny Him always overcome grace? Oh no, that's the exact opposite of what we've been saying, but. At least that well, no, but it's a it's a great question. It's a typical it's a typical question. Okay, so is it just for God to condemn someone if He could have given you a grace that you would have, um, you know, the, by which you would have been saved? Uh, well, then the question would be: Did you do? You, are you owed the grace? Um, and in fact, the whole category of grace exists for us to designate what we are not owed. Um, so grace has to be something that is undeserved. So in a way, we all deserve to be condemned insofar as we're sinners. Uh, but God, by his mercy, gives us grace. So we could say, well, wouldn't it have been better if God gave more grace? Um, yes, uh, it looks that way to us. Um, but who are we to... Um, stand in judgment of God's plan, you know, so that is, it's a dark mystery. And mm. I don't think we have a, I don't think we have an adequate explanation. Like why love it. could, could God have, could God have given me more graces? Yes, he could have. Why didn't he? I don't know. I don't know. Um, and I just have to say, I'm grateful to God for what he has given me. And insofar as I'm a sinner, uh, that's on me. It's, it's not on God. Um, so, you know, um, God loved the Blessed Virgin Mary. He loved St. Therese, the little flower, more than he loves me. Um, Maybe. Because You're he gave them... <laughs> I'm not done yet, but he, I mean, he saved, he saved St. Sure. Therese. He definitely loved the Blessed um, Virgin more than you and me. Yeah, there's no, I think there's no doubt um, that they, they received many more graces than I've received. Of course. And um, they were better than me. So um, I, I'm asking him to help me more, um, but I'm very grateful for what I've received because... Everything good that I have comes from him. I mean, that's that's in the end what Jesus tells us to to recognize that without him we can do nothing. And so, if we do anything good, it is to God's credit. Yeah. Very good. Well, I want to let everybody know before we get going here, we actually have Father Thomas Joseph White coming on the show soon. I don't know if you know about that, Father Leg. He's going to come on for an hour Q and A. So. For those who have millions of questions that are populating right now through this uh, live chat, you can be sure to come back for that. And I'm sure Father Thomas Joseph White would love to take any of these questions. But Father Leg, it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for making time out of your busy hey, schedule awesome. to be here. Great, uh, great two, being with you. Two, two more things before you wrap up. Plug to Mystic Institute again. I think you talked about a science uh, faith symposium. And then remind us of that book we all need to buy from uh, Pink Airs. Yeah, so uh, Thomistic Institute has the um, online free online video course, Aquinas 101, and our, we've just started Season 2, which is on science and faith. So it's really exciting. We've got contemporary scientists. We've got like a Harvard astronomer, a PhD in physics from Stanford, and then we've got Dominican theologians and philosophers coming together, making this video series, trying to go through the hot topics in science and faith. So everything from... Uh, creation and the Big Bang or the, um, the Bible and evolution to neuroscience and the soul to quantum mechanics and human freedom, a subject that maybe a lot of people are interested in, like does, I don't know, you know, the Schrodinger's cat experiment, thought mm -hmm. experiment, you know, does that disprove the principle of non-contradiction, things like that. So we got a quantum mechanics physicist talking about that and what that means. 
and uh, it should be really good. And it's animated short videos. It's all free. Go to Aquinas101.com and sign up for the course, and uh, we'd love to have you. So then plug number two, this is the book, Sources of Christian Ethics by Cerebase Pink Hairs, uh, and it's available from Catholic University Press. Excellent. All right. Thanks so much, Father. Hey, great being with you. God bless.